and then came out to Seattle where he completed his endocrine fellowship here at the University of Washington. Upon completion, he spent a year in Denmark as part of the Fogarty International Fellowship and then returned to Seattle where he joined the faculty um, at the University of Washington at the VA Medical Center. He currently holds title of professor in the Department of Medicine, uh, Chief Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism and Nutrition at the VA. Um, he's also the director at the Diabetes Endocrinology Research Center and associate director at the Diabetes Research Center. He's won several, um, several awards. He teaches in the medical school. He mentors uh, some of the fellows. He's an associate editor and editorial board uh, of multiple journals, and he also serves on many national and international committees. On top of all of this, of course, um, he is also very well funded for his research and has published hundreds of articles and book chapters. So it's with my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jerry Palmer, who's going to speak on the DCCT edict, answering type 1 diabetes questions for over 30 years. Well, thank you very much, and welcome everybody out here and folks listening on their computer and a variety of other ways. Um, as this slide was first being shown, uh, Bill said that's a bit of Photoshop magic. Uh, <clears throat> namely, uh, this is the VA hospital uh, here, and superimposed is the other VA hospital down in Tacoma. Uh, what we need is a space needle tucked in right about there. I have no uh, conflicts of interest. And this is the logo for the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. And the reason for the 30 years is it started in 1983, as you'll see, um, <clears throat> and is still uh, ongoing. So we have 31 years as of this year. A little bit of history, namely the DCCT started with a national commission which went around the country um, and polled folks as to what needed to be done in diabetes research. And one of the big questions that came up was whether or not glucose hyperglycemia is involved in all the complications of diabetes. This was thought to be important enough that in 1982, a request for applications, sorry, request for applications, um, having trouble with his mouse, and then <clears throat> we recruited patients from 83 to 89. The results that were published in the New England Journal in 93, and then the epidemiologic follow-up edict occurred over the following uh, 21 years now. This is a slide taken of the initial DCCT group. And I'll point out some people here. Uh, you can look and see if you can find me. That's John Service, John Dupre, Bernie Zinman, David Nathan, uh, John Lakeen. Um, Saul Ganuth. This is the director of the trial, Oscar Crawford, Fred Whitehouse, and there I am, tucked away back there. <clears throat> As I was mentioning to John Brunzel uh, this morning, a lot of these investigators have, in fact, remained with the edict study to date. So the hypothesis that was tested in the DCCT is that treatment that normalizes glucose levels will prevent or delay the long-term complications of diabetes. Now you may say, well, that's, everybody knows that. Um, and that is true now. Everybody knows it. But in the early 80s, there in fact were two big camps. Um, the East Coast camp that believed this, and in fact, the West Coast camp, which thought that the complications of diabetes were largely genetically 
determined, led by uh, Marvin Sipperstein and groups from California. Now it ends up, as you'll see, that both are true to a degree. But the DCCT needed to test the glucose hypothesis. So the Diabetes Control and Complications trial was a randomized intervention trial. 1,441 patients, 29 centers from the United States and Canada, recruitment from 83 to 89, and follow-up until public publication in 93. The EDIC study, Epidemiology of Diabetes Intervention and Complications, is the long-term follow-up study, which, as I've mentioned, is still ongoing. Now, of the 1,441 patients randomized, we still have 1,319 who are alive. And of those 1,319, 94% are still providing data for EDIC. You can say, well, how is that possible um, that 94% of people continue to show up? I think it's because of the people we selected for the DCCT. There was a two-week run-in period where folks had to stick their fingers, and people weren't necessarily accustomed to that back in 19, early 80s. They had to bring in 24-hour urines. Uh, and so we really developed what we call research partners, and they really are research partners to this day, and that's why such a large percentage continue to provide data uh, for us. The two treatment groups are summarized here. Conventional therapy was maintenance of clinical well-being. You could not use more than two shots a day. You could do self-monitoring, urine or blood. There were no glucose targets given for that. Um, and hemoglobin A1C measured quarterly was masked. That was compared to the intensive treatment group, where we wanted to achieve as close to normal hemoglobin A1C as possible. We had pre- and post-glucose targets. Fasting was 70 to 120. Postprandial was less than 180. We encouraged people to do at least four glucoses blood glucose is a day, up to 7, pre and post meal, bedtime, and then 3 a.m. Hemoglobin was measured, A1C was measured monthly, and we could share that with the patients. All treatment was paid for um, by our tax dollars uh, in the form of the DCCT grant. And what we found was that when patients entered the DCCT, their hemoglobin A1C was almost 9. And in the conventional treatment group, because we really were trying to mimic what was going on out in the community, there was no change in their hemoglobin A1C. In contrast, in the intensively treated group, their hemoglobin A1C rapidly fell, and it fell to around 7, so that we had a nice differential of almost 2 percentage points in hemoglobin A1C. And most importantly, this separation and this intensive control was maintained for the duration of the DCCT. Now, when the DCCT was initially started, a lot of critics said, well, you can get people to do that kind of stuff for a month or maybe a year, but never long term. And so that was one of the first lessons from the DCCT, that intensive treatment can markedly improve and maintain, but not normalize. And you'll see why in a couple of minutes. Glycemic control of patients 
with type 1 diabetes. Because remember, we were looking to get a hemoglobin A1C of 6, and where we ended up was a hemoglobin A1C of 7 <clears throat> in the experimental treatment group. This is the results of the primary endpoint, namely retinopathy, in the DCCT. The patients were divided into two groups, those that entered the trial and had no microaneurysms, no hint of retinopathy, no albuminuria, and they were termed the primary prevention because we wanted to ask, can we prevent new onset or delay new onset complications? The other is a group of individuals who had diabetes for 5 to 15 years, and they were the secondary intervention to see whether we could slow the progression. They had early complications of diabetes. And as you can see here, the results were really dramatic. Look very carefully here, namely, in the intensively treated group, there was, in fact, an initial worsening of their retinopathy. There have been hints of this in the literature before, um, but wisely, the Data Safety Monitoring Board did not stop the trial um, when that happened and went on to show this really dramatic uh, both prevention and slowing of retinopathy. In fact, it was so dramatic that the trial was stopped one year early, uh, earlier than, than planned. Now, the same kind of results were observed for early nephropathy as proteinuria and for neuropathy. There was a, a but, though, and that is that, as you can see here, there was about three times more hypoglycemia, no matter how you define it, severe, which means needing help from someone else, coma, seizure, ER, ER admissions, uh, fortunately there were no deaths. So the limiting factor that kept us from getting the hemoglobin A1C to 6 in the experimental treatment group was hypoglycemia. And it ended up that um, this group still had a rate of hypoglycemia that was three times that in the conventionally treated patients. And as you can see here, epidemiologically, as one goes down in hemoglobin A1C, improve control, you see a nice fall in retinopathy, but at the same time, you see a rise in the rate of hypoglycemia. So lesson number two is that intensive glycemic control reduces the risk of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy in patients with type 1 diabetes, but increases the risk of hypoglycemia. So here is a summary of EDIC, and that is to examine the long-term effects of the control achieved in the DCCT on the development and progression of more advanced stages of eye, kidney, and nerve disease, on cognitive function, and on macrovascular disease. So on the left here, you see the separation of hemoglobin A1C during the DCCT. Now at the end of the DCCT, in 1993, we were given the resources to train all the patients in the conventional arm in intensive therapy. On the other hand, those people in the intensive arm, their treatment was no longer covered by the DCCT. 
namely they had to pay for it, their insurance had to pay for it, as did all other patients. And so over the course of a few years, the hemoglobin A1C rose a little bit in the intensively treated group. It came down as expected in the conventionally treated group. There was separation for a number of years, but then for the last years, the hemoglobin A1C has been exactly the same uh, in the two treatment groups. So since hypoglycemia was more common in the intensively treated patients, one of the most important questions is do they pay a price in terms of cognitive function for this increased hypoglycemia? This was data from the DCCT and then EDIC, um, a total of 18 years. And as you can see on this slide, no matter whether in the upper left, you look at the data in terms of original treatment assignment, or whether number of severe hypoglycemic events, or as overall hemoglobin A1C, on this panel, there, there really was largely no difference. There was no statistically significant detriment in terms of cognitive function. And for two measures, psychomotor efficiency and motor speed, uh, shown here and here, there in fact is benefit from being in the intensively treated group. And so DCCT edict lesson number three is that intensive glycemic <coughs> control is not detrimental to cognitive function and in fact improves psychomotor efficiency and motor speed. Now in the DCCT, Nephropathy was largely assessed by albuminuria and proteinuria. And a subsequent study looking at 20 years of participation in DCCT edict, led by Ian DeBoer um, here at the University of Washington and published in the New England Journal, um, again showed that with a more important measure of renal function, again, there's protection afforded by intensive therapy. And this is further shown on this slide, so that the rate of decline in GFR in the intensively treated group at 1.27 milliliters per minute um, per meter squared per year um, was in fact highly significantly slower than the rate of decline uh, in the conventionally treated group. Number four is therefore intensive glycemic control reduces the detrimental effect of long-term type 1 diabetes on glomerular filtration. Now, at the end of the DCCT, we thought, well, it would be really important as the hemoglobin A1C is coming together to see, well, what happens over time in terms of the rate of complications? Does the rate of complications tend to come together, as shown here? Do you just get credit for what you did and then the rate of progression is exactly the same? Or, as shown on this panel, is there something special about intervening early that will then carry on even after the hemoglobin A1C is, no, uh, is similar? Well, the results of this have been published numerous times. Uh, 
And what is shown on this slide is that this is the end of the DCCT. Sorry. This here is a mouse is very, it's a way to advance slides too. <laughs> uh, in any event, here's the end of the DCCT. And even though the hemoglobin A1C was similar, the rate of complications continued to diverge out over edict. So what's plotted on the x-axis are the years in the edict study. And so what we found was that, in fact, this panel here is what happened. Namely, there was continued separation. And I found an example of how that might happen. And for a few people out there, this will be close to their their heart, and that's retirement. So we have two guys here, Jim and Joe. Uh, <clears throat> Joe, they both start working at age 25. Uh, Joe puts $1,000 uh, away each year, and Jim puts $2,000 away. And what you see, oh, thanks. Uh, the problem, I'm, I'll keep trying to do it. <laughs> because people out in the, uh, outside of here can't actually see the pointer. Um, that's why we're trying to use the mouse. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So after 20 years of investing in their retirement account, uh, Jim has a lot more money than Joe does. But then Joe wises up, and he starts in contributing $2,000 uh, a year. There's 10% interest also cranked into this. <laughs> so what happens? Here's the first 20 years, here's the next 20 years. Uh, and the lines continue to diverge. So the message both for young people out there <laughs> and for type 1 diabetes is that there is metabolic memory. There's what's called imprinting. There's a legacy effect. Um, legacy was the term uh, uh, that was seen in the type 2 patients. Um, so you see the same thing in type 1, type 2. Um, but the most important take-home message is here, namely, initiate intensive glycemic control as early as possible. This is a slide to introduce macrovascular disease. This is the anterior descending artery, uh, coronary artery of an individual who obviously died um, because of a thrombus and a fatal myocardial infarction. And the DCCT edict looked at macrovascular disease. And if you take this as, and what I've just shown here is the um, most hard endpoints, a non-fatal MI, a stroke, or in fact cardiovascular death, um, there's again a lot of protection from intensive treatment versus conventional treatment. Lesson number six, Intensive glycemic control reduces the risk of cardiovascular events. So let me share with you now some data regarding C-peptide. 
And what we have here is the insulin B chain, A chain, this whole thing is pro-insulin. Um, and this is the C peptide molecule. And the reason that I show this is that we use C peptide since it is secreted in an equimolar concentration to insulin, we can use C peptide to measure insulin secretion, endogenous beta cell function, in patients who are taking insulin. And this was done in the DCCT. And what we found was that intensive treatment, in fact, markedly slowed the rate of decline in C-peptide. And what's plotted here are individuals who had a C-peptide above 0.2 picomoles per ml. Now you might imagine, well, is that important metabolically? And the answer is yes. So responders are defined as individuals who had a peak C-peptide during a mixed meal tolerance test above 0.2. Non-responders were less than 0.2. And as you can see, when they entered the DCCT, now this is the hemoglobin A1C that was achieved out in the community by the patients and their providers, there was about a 1% point difference with the higher numbers being in the non-responders, those people um, with less C-peptide. When intensive treatment was initiated, there was a rapid fall, but there was over a large number of years a relative protection in terms of hemoglobin A1C. And so what one has is what might be called a virtuous cycle. Better diabetes control results in less beta cell damage, preserved beta cell function, and that feeds back to give you, in fact, better diabetes control. So edict lesson number seven is that intensive glycemic control preserves endogenous insulin secretion, which improves glycemic control, resulting in a virtuous cycle. So this is again the difference in hemoglobin A1C in the two treatment groups, uh, or not two treatment groups, but in those who are responders and non-responders treated with intensive therapy. And you might say, well, does this lower hemoglobin A1C, does that result in less complications? And of course the answer is yes. And this is only patients in intensive treatment and we didn't know as people taking care of these patients, and the patients didn't know whether they were a responder or not. Um, but as you can see here, in terms of the primary endpoint, retinopathy, there was more progression in the non-responders than there was in the responders. This was true for not only retinopathy, but also nephropathy. On the other hand, if you look at hypoglycemia, the responders were relatively protected, namely they had less hypoglycemia. They weren't as low as the conventionally treated group, but they were closer to that than the rate of hypoglycemia, uh, here the most severe hypoglycemia, um, seen in the intensive non-responders with C-peptides less than 0.2. So DCCT edict lesson number eight is that in type 1 diabetes patients treated with intensive therapy, 
a stimulated C peptide above 0.2 is associated with improved glycemic control, less retinopathy, less nephropathy, and less hypoglycemia. Very recently, uh, John Lakeen, Paula McGee, and myself have looked again at the C-peptide at entry. Now, up until now, I've been talking about C-peptides above and below 0.2, and that's shown here. So all the data we've looked at now is out here with higher C-peptides. But the assay actually went down to 0.03 picomole. And so we asked, is there a relationship in terms of retinopathy with even lower amounts of C-peptide? Um, and as you can see, there's a dramatic effect. Uh, namely, the change in the rate of retinopathy um, as you're C-peptide gets lower and lower. And so DCCT edict lesson number nine is that even very low levels of C-peptide are clinically beneficial. There are quite a number of other studies now showing that. And there does not appear to be a C-peptide threshold for clinical benefit. Now, I mentioned to you that we randomized 1,441 type 1 diabetes patients, but we screened 3,736 type 1 diabetes patients. That is, people who their referring provider thought had type 1 diabetes. And so we got the opportunity, and we screened them by a mixed meal tolerance test, um, we got the opportunity to look at how much C-peptide do people with type 1 diabetes have. And much to, I think, an awful lot of people's surprise, certainly it was for those of us doing the DCCT, uh, if you look in the first five years, almost half of the people were above 0.2, and we didn't let anybody into the DCCT who had a C-peptide above 0.5, so we excluded all these people. Um, and even when you go out here, there's a sizable percentage of people, 8%, who have clearly metabolically significant amounts of C-peptide. This is in patients who were adults at the time. Um, you see a slight shift, namely more severe beta cell lesion in those who are adolescents, age 13 to 18. But even still, 33% of the people um, with diabetes, type 1 diabetes, out to the age, uh, or out to five years of duration, um, had much more C-peptide, endogenous insulin secretion, than the textbooks would ever say. Um, namely, a lot of textbooks were saying, and some even say today, that most patients, after a few years of type 1 diabetes, have no clinically significant beta cell function. Um, that's just a myth. So edict lesson number 10. Um, is that more type 1 diabetes patients have higher C-peptide levels many years after diagnosis than commonly assumed, um, especially when type 1 diabetes is diagnosed as an adult. I'd like to mention um, major collaborators for the DCCT here at the University of Washington. Uh, Ian DeBoer, I've, I've mentioned for uh, nephropathy. Jim Kenyon has been participating uh, since the beginning in terms of retinopathy. Uh, Earl Hirsch uh, currently cares for a large number of the 
BCCT, now EDIC patients, and participated in several projects. Um, John Purnell, when he was here, uh, John per Von Zell, and Santisa Markovina, um, all have looked at the body weight gained by people in intensive therapy um, and what effect that may have on their macrovascular disease. Um, and Hunter Wessel um, has been uh, looking at the genital urinary complications of diabetes as a result of this trial. Future investigations are going to focus on C-peptide. Namely, we now have funding to do mixed meal tolerance tests on everyone in uh, who is still in EDIC. Um, we're looking at hearing, and we're looking at macrovascular disease. The original New England Journal paper was decided to be analyzed when 50 people in the conventionally treated group had had a macrovascular event. Um, the next analysis will be when 100 have had an event, and that um, time is rapidly approaching. And then finally, as a perspectives in diabetes, uh, there was a very nice review article published um, last year, which will go over most of the things that I've said here today. Um, but also uh, a lot more. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm <laughs> sorry to get done early, but that won't hurt anybody. <laughs> Any questions? John. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, the answer is yes. Um, there is. Uh, and I don't know that the data really comes as much from the DCCT edict as it, you know, does other places. There's a Yeah, well, yes and no. If you, if, you, if you assume that people with excellent hemoglobin A1Cs are receiving intensive therapy, um, there is a very nice relationship. In fact, um, there's a recent New England Journal paper, which is just about to come out, that is from Sweden looking at macrovascular in fact, death in patients divided according to their hemoglobin A1C, which of course can, is only done in countries like Sweden where they have the, everyone with diabetes in a registry. Um, and I think it's a threefold increase in those patients with type 1 diabetes who have even the best hemoglobin A1C. And then it keeps marching up with every hemoglobin A1C window that they looked at. Um, so I think, there, I think there is a risk. You know, as you know, and uh, as was found in the DCCT, a lot of the macrovascular disease risk in type 1 diabetes is conferred by those patients who have renal disease. Um, and so, one of the ways to protect against the macrovascular disease is the, is the protection against renal disease that is achieved by intensive glycemic control. Yeah. But you also, the, you know, other things that I think are worth mentioning. Namely, not only were these people selected um, <clears throat> to not have uh, or to have 
either none or early complications, they were also selected to, to try to not muddy the waters with hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So those people were also excluded. So we, were, we, we began with really a, a quite a healthy population of people with type 1 diabetes. Yes. Um, th that is one of the, the claims. The Pittsburgh people, though, I think did do a little bit worse. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Mark. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think there, that that whole area has been somewhat disappointing. Uh, um, you know, it's thought that somehow glucose itself is toxic. Now, this this doesn't. Of course, there are lots of other things that are improved in people who are on intensive therapy that might uh, affect the beta cell. Um, you know, I, I think everyone wishes we knew the answer to that question for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We don't understand the progressive, you know, we think we understand it in type 1. It's the autoimmune disease continuing to attack the beta cell. Why do people with type 2 diabetes have a progressive disease? Is it, you know, as Steve Kahn would argue, is it IAPP? Is it ER stress? Is it oxidative stress? It just, uh, there are lots of possibilities, um, and maybe they're uh, they're all true. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of that. It may very well have been done. The major thing that comes out of uh, most studies is the age at which you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, if you're diagnosed at age 5, uh, you have a much more rapid decline in C-peptide, and I showed that for data here, the, namely the adolescents versus the adults. Uh, and in the, we did a pilot study um, in the EDIC patients um, just to see how many of them had residual C-peptide, now with improved C-peptide assays. Um, a very large proportion, like 20%, had clearly quite a lot of C-peptide. That was also uh, largely determined by how old you were when you developed type 1 diabetes. So, yeah. yeah, I have a, a question follow-up oh, on John's, uh, yeah. John's question on the macrovascular disease. The results are, I agree, really impressive. I guess from, from my reading of the literature, it's been quite a bit of a challenge to show an effect like that in type 2 diabetes. And, I'm, and, and the debates continue about whether there is an effect of type control yeah. in preventing macrovascular events in type 2 diabetes. But how can, how can you account for that difference? Well, I, I think the, one of the, the larger studies looking at macrovascular disease in type 2, if I recall correctly. The, um, uh, forgetting the acronym for it. But um, did show protection. Um, now, one has to be very careful when you're looking at these statistics. Is the, For instance, in the DCCT and EDIC, 90 plus percent of the treatment effect has been found to be related to the hemoglobin A1C. Now that's the difference between the two treatment arms. That's a very different question as to say how much of retinopathy is due to hyperglycemia. There still may be, for instance, other things involved. In that. And this, I think the same thing applies to type 2 patients. Because I think if you look at studies that have 
compared glycemic control, you see a difference. On the other hand, when you look at macrovascular disease in type 2 patients, just epidemiologically, you find that blood pressure is, in fact, more important than glycemic control. Lipid control may be more important than glycemic control. So I think it, it, it's how you look at the data. And it's not to say that glucose isn't important, but that other things besides glucose um, are more important. And as we know in the DCCT edict, and we know from very old uh, Danish studies, that the people who do poorly with type 1 diabetes, just in general, but who also who die prematurely, are those with renal disease. Now, of course, not everyone with a hemoglobin A1C of 9 gets renal disease. And some of that is genetic, and there's lots of other factors in there. Thank you. Oh, thank you.